Good afternoon and welcome to Marketing Live for Thursday, May the 5th, 2016. I'm your host, Rob Zinkin, and it is such an exciting time of the year for students as finals wrap up, and it's commencement week here at Indiana University. I serve as Associate Vice President for Marketing at Indiana, and I'm looking forward to today's discussion with two senior leaders in the industry as we talk about marketing org structures. Marketing Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network offering viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in education, and that's exactly what we have today. Live broadcasts allow viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the most important issues in our sector. All episodes of Marketing Live are free and accessible in the video archives at higheredlive.com and in podcast format on iTunes. Today's live viewing experience is powered by Maestro, the premier marketing tech platform for broadcasters. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. We're about to share a link to M. Stoner's ebook on information architecture, a well thought out, well organized structure for your content will make it easier for visitors to find information and engage with your institution. The ebook includes best practices and examples, so download it now. That's coming via Twitter. Thanks, as always, to M. Stoner. So let's meet today's guests for Marketing Live, starting with Kyle Henley. Kyle is Vice President for University Communications at the University of Oregon. He joined Oregon last year from Colorado State University, where he was Assistant VP for Strategic Communications. He was an award-winning journalist for more than a decade before moving into public relations and communications with experience in both the corporate world and agency environment. So, Kyle, great to have you with us. Thank you so much, Robert. It's really a pleasure. And Bill Campbell, who is Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Chatham University. Bill joined Chatham in 2012 and has played a lead role in Chatham's transition to co-ed in its undergraduate women's college, which we'll discuss today. Bill earned the 2015 Higher Ed Marketer of the Year Award, the Innovator Award, from the AMA. And prior to Chatham, Bill worked for more than a decade at Clean Design, a brand and design agency in Raleigh, North Carolina. Bill, nice to see you. Welcome. Hey, Rob. Nice to see you. Glad to be here. And as I mentioned earlier, excellent article, by the way, in the May-June issue of Case Currents. That was great. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to begin, so that viewers have an opportunity to get to know both of you a little bit better, let's go beyond the bio and start there. And I'd like to ask you to share something from your professional journey, whether that's a specific experience or anything noteworthy that has shaped you and your career. So, Kyle, let's start with you. Oh, absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, you know, I'm not sure exactly what to focus on. I, I think the thing that, that sparked my professional journey was journalism and wanting to be uh, a great journalist and a storyteller. And, um, you know, some of the things that really shaped me, even though I was a political reporter uh, for most of my career, were some of the fun things I got to do that were tied into my personal passion, which is the outdoors and skiing and, and mountain biking and some of these kind of things. And the process of uh, having the opportunity to do some, some of those kind of stories for the LA Times and just uh, the, the in-depth process of writing a travel story and what that looks like. And as I look today at the journalism or, or the kind of things that we do in higher education, it's about doing that in-depth enterprise reporting that has been kind of an inspiration to me for my entire career. And um, I tap into those things that make me excited about the work that I used to do um, as, as we do and in, in kind of do these enterprise stories for the University of Oregon. And, and that's one of the fun things for me is kind of tapping into that passion uh, that for me uh, I was able to do as a, or a young journalist. That's great. Great. Thanks, Kyle. And Bill, something about your story that has had an impact on you over the years. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I always say I got the bug for advertising and marketing um, naturally. My mother was in advertising for John Deere for 30-plus years, and, and those commercials, you know, you see in local TV where the, the car dealer brings out his, you know, children uh, who are, um, you know, to help sell the cars. I was one of those annoying but hopefully cute little kids that came out to help my dad sell cars, uh, the real in-depth ad campaign that was across radio and TV. So anyway, very influential in me in, in middle school and high school, just kind of being exposed to this field of advertising and marketing. 
and uh, and what that meant. And then again in college, um, to be able to get a job while I was also at, at school with the um, athletic department and sports marketing. And so it was really wonderful to kind of see that come to life uh, while I was learning. Um, and then, you know, 10, 15 years later, here I am as a marketer back in college, back in higher ed. And so it's kind of come full circle in that way. Great. Well, if you want to uh, tweet out links to uh, archives of some of those old spots, I'm sure people <laughs> would love to love to take a look or we can get the research staff on it and, and find those somehow and pull them out. Love, to, love to see those. They're award winning, so I'm sure they're easily out there somewhere. <laughs> Well, again, it's great having both of you for this episode as it gives us both a, a big school perspective and smaller school perspective. And for some context setting as we discuss and get into details around marketing organizational structures, let's get a breakdown of, of what your current structures look like when it comes to marketing. And, and let's start with, with your roles in terms of being the, the chief marketing officer and what that role encompasses at your institution, how does it fit into the organizational structure, where does it report, is it part of the president's team, president's council, those sorts of things around the CMO role. So uh, Bill, let's keep going with you and, and give us the scoop on, on what that looks like at Chatham. Yeah, so um, I've been at Chatham about four and a half years now. I was hired in January of 2012 and really to, to bring a strategic marketing function to Chatham. Um, at the time, uh, we were a, marketing was a small function, traditionally a little more PR and communications oriented. So I was hired at the cabinet level, so I'm a vice president who reports up to the president um, and have been tasked really with um, essentially brand communications, uh, marketing communications as it supports all of the institutional priorities across admissions, advancement, the president's office, um, and building that infrastructure for creative services inside. And so. Um, that's the structure for us now. We do not have, um, you know, school or department level marketers embedded throughout the university. It's a centralized model where everything runs through us in the sense of providing strategic uh, marketing uh, layer of support and then also a creative services layer of support serving the um, institution. My background uh, as an, in the agency world really has been uh, helpful to me as we've really built out an internal agency model that um, has been able to scale and grow as we've added capabilities in writing, in digital um, and web design, um, and other aspects of that over the four years that I've been here. Okay, great. And then Kyle, the the, the bigger school perspective and at Oregon, give us uh, some insight on your organizational structure for marketing and what that looks like and the report, some of the reporting lines in terms of uh, upward to the, the, the president or, or chancellor position. Absolutely. Um, this is actually a fairly new position for the University of Oregon. Um, before I had joined the school, the marketing functions had reported up through advancement. Um, and at the time that I was appointed vice president for communications, uh, that's where the president of the university decided to make the decision that university communication should be a cabinet level position. So that was just in September of last year. So this is a new structure for the University of Oregon. Um, as part of that, I think it encompasses really the majority of the, the kind of functions that you would see in a large communication shop web design, graphic design, uh, public affairs communications, uh, you know, uh, uh, alumni and development communications are all part of our shop. This position is part of the cabinet and part of the senior leadership team and I do report directly to the president. We have about um, uh, 50 people who are part of our organization. Um, and we're, we're growing that right now through the integration efforts that we have on campus where we're really uh, in the process of reimagining uh, what a higher education communication shop should be for the University of Oregon. Great, and, and definitely want to get into the, the specifics of that. Uh, and Bill mentioned at, at Chatham having a, a very centralized model at Oregon, more of a decentralized structure, but it, it appears that that's moving towards, as you said, integration. Give us some uh, background on the move towards uh, having better integration when it comes to um, marketing across the university and the various schools and units and uh, what has prompted you to, to move in that direction to have better integration? I think there's a number of things. The University of Oregon has an incredibly strong national brand. In some cases we have this incredibly strong national brand in spite of ourselves. 
um, at this university over the last you know five, six, seven years, really it had grown into a very siloed communication structure uh, that was quite fragmented, where um, not only within the administration but also within the academic units that they all had their own communications infrastructure and that there was no coordination or tie back into uh, strategic marketing or strategic communications uh, on behalf of the university. Um, and that's something that as an institution, um, I, I make the joke a lot of times that in my life in corporate America, I worked for a big agribusiness bank and I learned more about um, grain silos and, and storing corn and hedging uh, soybeans on, on, on the board of, on, on the futures market um, than I care to. Uh, but you know silos in that case is a place where you mitigate risk. In a large organization like a university, silos are a place where you actually create reputational risk and 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 really create opportunities to um, uh, to create challenges for yourself. Uh, and so one of there's a whole host of things that we went through. About a year ago, the interim president of the university had charged uh, the marketing department with doing an audit of all of the communications functions of the university. As part of that audit, we found that there were about 150 to 160 people across the university who, who touched marketing and communications in one way, shape, or form. Uh, there are about 40 or 50 of those that were within a central marketing unit. There was about another 70 that were within the administrative units that were run by the vice presidents. And then there was probably another 30 or 40 within the academic units. Um, and really, the university is in one of those places where we said, you know, we, we have to have better collaboration. We have to have better coordination. Messaging is so critical uh, to a university where we have a lot of things that are moving right now. Um, and and really the decision was made at the presidential level, but also with a lot of discussion with cabinet and with other leaders throughout the university to say, um, we need to address this. And I, I should back up and say, this is also a problem throughout a whole host of other business um, functions of the university, whether it's IT, uh, where, where a few months ago a, a consultant had found that there are 27 separate IT infrastructures within our organization that don't talk to each other and don't necessarily work well together. HR, uh, back office business functions. So really what we kind of said was that university communications is one of the places where we're going to look at consolidating to improve consistency of message and also to find uh, some efficiency and to, to make sure that we've got better coordination uh, than we had in the past. And, and to follow up on that, Kyle, we, we know that, that your institution received a, a lot of attention for the, the decision to cancel a contract with a branding agency earlier this academic year, but it seems like at the heart of that decision was just what you elaborated on, addressing some of the inefficiencies and redundancies that are, that are simply the byproduct of having a decentralized marketing structure. So trying to move towards a more centralized operation at Oregon what what does that process even look like? I would imagine it's a it's a very significant shift. So you and your team have a lot to work through in terms of planning and implementing and leading this change. Take us through this this change process and and what are the things that you're working on and how are you getting some of those unit based or academic unit based uh, marketers on board with this and how is the process going? Yeah, absolutely. Let me first just talk about the branding uh, company decision. I, I think a lot of institutions make decisions about whether they're going to work with an outside agency. Um, in this case, we had a good relationship with ours, and, and we had already done a lot of the hard work in terms of the discovery and really um, implementation of a strong visual brand standards for the university. And really, the, the decision to do that was, a, was a, a financial and business decision based on availability of funds and resources. Um, and um, I don't think from the outside world perspective uh, that there's going to be a lot of difference in terms of the work that we're doing from a branding and marketing a visual identity um, kind of perspective. Um, we're going to continue that work. It's going to continue to flow through our, our advertising, our marketing, and the look and feel that we have throughout the university. Um, and I would just say that we, let me now jump to kind of the integration efforts. We launched these in January, and we really set that we were going to have a six-month transition period. 
where we would do analysis and work closely. And we decided that we were only going to start with the administrative units. So that would be only the vice president's vice presidential units that reported up to the president. Um, and that we were not going to, to look at an integration model that included the academic units. Um, and that really covered about um, 70 people that we had identified. Um, as we were able to kind of get in and really look more closely at some of the, uh, at the job descriptions and position, position descriptions, we found that in many cases some of these folks weren't necessarily doing communications work. Um, even though there may have been something that had indicated they were uh, underneath their, their, their PD. Um, and so we were kind of able to whittle that down and to better understand what people were really doing through sitting down and talking with them, looking at their PDs, looking at functionally doing desk audits of what they were functionally doing on a daily basis. Um, and then really then we're able to identify who the right individuals were or positions were to look at integration. And we were focused on things like strategic communications, public relations, graphic design, web design, social media, uh, all of the kind of classic things that you would see as traditional communications roles. Um, and so what we said was that over a six month period we were going to identify who those people were. We were going to work within the leadership structure to um, position them and find the right management structure within university communications where they would report. Um, and that beginning July 1 is when we would have kind of the firm cutover uh, to a centralized model where they would report into our shops. Um, we made a couple of decisions as part of that when we looked at the complexity of some of the various organizations that we serve. Um, there were some clear places where it made sense just to move them right into our shop. And then there are some places where the special, kind of the, the specialized nature of the work that's being done um, merited maybe a little bit different approach. So if you look at enrollment management or student life, in both of those cases they have kind of fairly large complex marketing arms underneath them. What we did is we opted for a joint report model where the director of communications for our enrollment management group and for our student life group uh, are joint reports to the VP for enrollment management and the VP for student life. Um, and the, and the, and the communications infrastructure underneath reports up through them. Um, and then uh, we found that that's really been a great way to, to improve coordination and collaboration among shops that previously had not worked well together. Great. And Bill, if we can take a look at Chatham and, and the marketing structure that, that you've built there when you were hired, as you said, to bring strategic marketing leadership to, to Chatham a few years ago. And certainly your institutions move at the undergraduate level to, to co-ed as a result of the, the research and the report from your team is a wonderful example of the strategic role that marketing can and marketing should play in a rapidly changing higher ed landscape. So to try to get a sense of, of how your structure has evolved during that time and, and some of the considerations that you've had over the years as you continue that move towards a, a very strategic role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting is, is the scale that Kyle is talking about with the centralized and elements of decentralization in their model. You know, we experience a lot of that just on a much smaller scale. And, and as, we, as we grow, and we've gone from two people in marketing when I was, I was hired to seven now in, in four years, um, and we, we provide more services and we provide more strategic offerings um, and creative offerings to those groups, the amount of work also grows. And so we begin to quickly start to see um, you know, the, the needs potentially in the future for some marketing managers to handle admissions or to handle uh, alumni relations and advancement. Um, so it's that scale model that as a small school starts to, to invest in marketing that you can begin to see how um, your scale can begin to change and how your structures might begin to think where you can provide the level of services that a high demand um, business unit like admissions or advancement or student life could require and that's one of our kind of emerging pain points as we scale um, ultimately we need you know resources to support the level of work um, that sophisticated marketing requires um, you know for our perspective again the reason for my hire and what we're doing is the institution was very keenly aware and wanting to know how we were spending our marketing dollars, why we were spending our marketing dollars, and what the results of spending those marketing dollars were. And you had different divisions uh, of people doing slight variations of that 
Um, there might be some person in admissions who was doing some marketing function or others that were there, not quite at the scale Kyle mentioned, but there was they were they were there and not necessarily embedded. So the centralization of all that has allowed uh, uh, me and uh, and my team to have a really good view of what the institution is doing in terms of our budget, where we're spending it, how we're spending it, and what we're saying in that. And um, so that role is really what began to lead to some of the strategic decision making that we've been able to offer. For years and years and years, the institution was doing campaign X, campaign Y, campaign Z with different messaging and getting similar results or not really knowing what the results of those efforts were um, overall for our um, campaign. And so ultimately, um, you know, one of the things that we began to look at was Chatham as a whole is, is was founded as an undergraduate women's college with 500 students. Over the last two decades, it's scaled to about 2,200 students, of which two-thirds of those are graduate programs. And the undergraduate women's college was always an important and critical part of us, but, um, but necessarily was declining in enrollment. So a strategic marketing approach allowed me at a time when uh, the institution was beginning to really look at education as a whole, undergraduate and graduate, and where we go as a brand moving forward, that before I could get too far into what our brand stands for, we had these very siloed, almost product marketing things. We had a brand that had to speak to an undergraduate women's college experience, a traditional graduate school experience with a very heavy emphasis on health sciences, and then an online emerging online experience, and an emerging sustainability and environmental commitment that Chatham has. So it was very fractured. And what we began to find in looking at market research and looking at the data that was showing us in our underperforming product marketing units, like, like the undergraduate women's college, that over time, um, less and less you know, young women were interested in, in considering it. So you weren't even in the early awareness or consideration set. Um, and at the same time, we also saw that the sector was experiencing big decline. And our ability to begin to centralize allowed me to see that we were essentially spending three times the amount on marketing for the undergraduate women's college, which inherently undergraduate edu um, enrollment marketing can be more expensive than graduate anyway. But you know, nearly two to three times more over three years for significantly declining results. And what happened was we began to say, this is not a problem of marketing different, of marketing harder, or potentially throwing more money behind the marketing. We had to fundamentally look at the market and consider some, some very heavy brand and product and mission changes to the institution if we were going to be effective in our marketing down the line. So that's the research, that's the report that I was able to put together and that being a cabinet level position who was hired to bring this in was able to take to the president which was then able to take to the board and began a conversation and a lot of additional research around the institution um, to move this conversation forward which ultimately after a very difficult but you know um, clear in some ways decision at the end of the day to make this and you know the results of it in the first year we went from you know 600 applications give or take I don't know the exact numbers right now off the top of my head but you know going to 1,200 applications, to go from a class of 147 students to deposited students of 300 in the first year. And again, that is kind of where the, the, the impact of strategic marketing can help. Um, and we did that by spending the exact same or even less than we spent in the previous years when we were recruiting for co-ed. Yeah, kudos to you and your team for your work. It's such a, such a great story. And uh, just a quick reminder to, to viewers, if you do have a question or comment for Kyle or Bill, feel free to send it via Twitter and use the higher ed live hashtag and Bill you mentioned some of the emerging pain points as you experience growth and I'm interested to hear from both of you beyond what you've already articulated are there other uh, challenges or, or minuses to your current structure not even necessarily minuses but opportunity areas and just overall as you look at your structure and I'm sure it's something that you you're constantly thinking about and and it's constantly evolving as you look to enhance but are there some other pluses and minuses to the way that you're organized right now? I'll just jump in, and I think Bill alluded to it, is that as you are growing, you have to be able to expand the services that you're providing to your clients on campus. And so while we've been moving from a decentralized model to a more centralized model or a hybrid centralized model, there are some you know, awkward conversations where you are talking with another VP or department head and, and you're going to see a line that they've had in their department move out of their group and move into central communications. And there's a lot of unsettling um, and kind of nervous and tough political things that go with that. 
Um, and what we've tried to position this as and, 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 and demonstrate it in our hiring priorities uh, is that, you know, in the past, it was funny, I would sit down with some of the marketers on campus and I would talk to them about the work that they do and they would oftentimes go in and they'd talk with a dean or a VP or somebody and they'd, and they'd say, you need a, I need a new brochure, I need a new website. And then this one person would go sit in an office by themselves and try and figure out how they were going to do that. Um, without any support and also without kind of the, the grounding and strategy that I, we all know is so critical. Um, so part of the value proposition that I've tried to make to folks as we move through this integration process is that um, through this we will be able to provide you with more support than you have had in the past. Um, rather than being a, one, a shop of one or two or three, you're a shop of 70 or 80 and you have both the strategic expertise to help you really define what your priorities and goals are and the expertise and tactical execution so that you do not have to rely on one person to do that. You can go work with our web team. Uh, you can go work with our graphic design team. You can work with uh, our photographer, photographers and videographers. Um, and so I've tried to put a premium on hiring those positions that are going to be a service to um, to our units across campus. So uh, this university, when I first arrived, you know, we're a, we're a 24,000 students, but we had one video person for the entire university. Uh, you know, my first hire was to hire another one, um, and I've already got both of them booked. I could hire three more. Um, and I, you know, I think it's it's trying to demonstrate to campus and your clients and your partners on campus that you are putting your resources towards services that are going to benefit them and show. Uh, and, and deliver on those results. Um, and that's the way I've tried to frame it uh, as we've moved through this process. As we talk about these questions, I will mention that Simpson Scarborough, The Chronicle, and Case are partnering for a comprehensive study of higher ed marketing, and data collection for that has just begun. Uh, this year's study will build on the 2014 research to track our industry's progress and also address some new questions regarding staffing and new marketing trends. CMOs or equivalent, the highest ranking marketing professional on campus, uh, are invited to participate and participants receive a customized survey link and I filled mine out on Friday so if you have not received one we've tweeted out a link with details on how to get one and you can also via that link review results to the 2014 survey. And those results uh, for the 2016 survey will be released at the AMA Symposium for the Marketing of Higher Education in December. So very much looking forward to, to seeing an updated version from that uh, inaugural study from back in 2014. So uh, feel free, if you have not gotten that info, to go ahead and, and get that and certainly complete the survey. And I do want to follow up, Kyle, as you talk about some of the changes happening in Oregon and you use the, the, the videographer as an example. If you could give us a sense of what have been the, the financial ramifications of this in terms of how does all this work financially, whether that's a shared position or whether that's creative services and uh, unit level needs creative services, how they interface with your office. office. So I'm, I'm sure there's a whole financial picture to this. And, can you give us a sense of how that's worked or how that, that piece of it is evolving? I, I would say it is continuing to evolve. Um, and there are many conversations that we're having uh, as we talk through that. Uh, Oregon's in an interesting spot. If you add up all of the salary and uh, OPE and kind of total comp packages that we're spending, it's about $12 million a year on marketing and communications on campus. <laughs> That uh, does not include the amount of outsourcing that's taking place, which is about, you know, we, we've got a variety of estimates because it's actually in a decentralized model, model harder to track than you think. Um, but, you know, between about 1.5 to more than $3 million. Um, and so we, we recognize that there are tremendous um, resources that the university is spending on marketing. And so part of the integration model is really about how do we create, how do we understand what that, what those resources are that are being spent? How do we, how do we put in place some, um, some controls may not be the right word, but how do we put in place some ability to monitor and understand where outsourcing is taking place? How do we put in place um, what we've called an input, kind of an intake review process where, where jobs are submitted 
into the university uh, communications process at, at the start and we make a decision as to whether or not a project can be managed or completed in-house and if so then we move it into our kind of in-house communications cha channel and pipeline and if not then it moves into an external contracting process I, I don't know about other institutions, but I, I think we all know that as soon as you move things off to contracting, it can take long, a long time, and you know there's headaches and bureaucracy that go with that. And so part of the value proposition, again, that we've tried to bring is that um, by through this process, we are going out right now and negotiating some umbrella contracts with um, you know frequently used outsources, uh, outsourcing vendors, whether it's agencies or uh, individual videographers or photographers or web builders, um, so that we have some umbrella contracts in place and we can speed up the process for our friends on campus um, and really provide them value. Um, and there are some cases where if it's a true custom contract, they have to kind of go through the whole process. Um, you know, we will see where we net out on this. What I'm hoping is that it's going to be able to, uh, over time, as we collect data about how much outsourcing is taking place, then I'm able to go back to to our, our, our VP for uh, Finance and Administration and the President and say, look, we're spending X number of dollars on 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 web or on video, and I can hire. Uh, you know, additional resources at a savings to the university to do that and, and provide more of those services in house where it's appropriate. Okay, great, great. And then, Bill, in your scenario, where you you have a centralized operation and your own set of uh, institutional priorities, how do some of those unit specific or academic school, college, or even program uh, initiatives or or priorities? How do those ladder up in terms of yeah. how you prioritize? Well, first, I just need to get over my budget envy with Kyle here a little bit. You know, I'll be able. I'm a little choked up. And I'll be able to talk, but uh, uh, um, you know, we we do as a smaller um, institution, we do have a, a much smaller marketing budget. And one of the things, like Kyle, I I do have some freelance um, capacities. I freelance video. I freelance um, some elements of public relations, um, and other like that, and do track that because that is such a great way for me trying to build a a new department to be able to make the business case for the next hire or the next person to support this. We've instituted um, you know, job trafficking systems to be able to track and know by client how many we're doing. So each year in the budget cycle I can go in and say, hey listen, you know, we just implemented a CRM and you know, that created you know, 150 new projects that have to be done by my group in order to support admissions. And so that's a very critical component of what we do um, overall. Uh, so it's again, it's very sim interesting to hear Kyle speak with the things he's encountering at a much larger scale, but that we're feeling and doing um, at, at a smaller scale too. So while different, we have many of the same issues and pain points as higher ed markers to deal with. Um, the other thing that I'll, I'll just say too is, is you know, with with a limited budget. So you know, if we have about two million dollars total marketing budget to spend, it's very important for us to make sure that we're spending that do those dollars effectively and in, in programs that can support it. Um, you know, we do have a brand marketing layer, but a lot of what we do is product marketing. So how do we support undergraduate enrollment or graduate enrollment at the program level? And so we spend a lot of time before we even get into campaigns um, trying to look at which markets, which programs are underperforming in the market. We do significant iPads analysis of degrees conferred to, to track median to see if we're performing about at or above the median in our states for programs. So it's very important to us that I'm able to to say to uh, a program director, or to the president, or others in the president's council, that you know these are the programs that have potential. This is where we should be spending our marketing dollars, and let's go forward. And unfortunately, there are losers in that, and so there are hard conversations where you may have a program that's just underperforming. You don't have the resources and people, the resources and money to support it, or the market is just saying, you know what, this is a program that you know the institution has to make some very hard choices about and perhaps consider can we grow it, can we not, and go forward. So um, you know that can be a challenge for a small institutional um, institution like ours where you have to have those conversations and present the data to move forward because everybody will come to you and say I just need a brochure, I just need a new web page and that's <laughs> going to fix everything. And you know it's much deeper than that as we know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mentioned the 2014 study by the, the Chronicle and Simpson Scarborough and those results show that approximately half of chief marketing officers 
report directly to the institution's president or chancellor, and that nearly 60% serve on the president's cabinet or leadership team. And historically, these positions might have reported up through advancement, as Kyle indicated, or through admissions. And you both hold VP level roles for communications and marketing. So I want to get in a little bit deeper in how you interact with those two functions. And I'll start, Kyle, with you, especially since your unit had reported up through advancement. What is the, the relationship with advancement at Oregon now, and how do you work with that unit? It's actually one of the strongest relationships that we have on campus. Um, we, when we went through the integration process, uh, the vice president for advancement, uh, Mike Andreessen, who's just a, a class act and one of the best, um, you know, he really said, look, let's embrace integration. Let's look at how we can do things better within advancement. How can we improve that? the service that we provide to alumni, to donors, and to kind of the outside world um, in an integrated model. So one of the early moves that we made here was to integrate uh, communicators from the Alumni Association, from our development communications group, and then also I put uh, in that group our alumni magazine, pardon me, Oregon Quarterly, uh, which uh, goes out to about a, you know, almost 200,000 people. So really what we've kind of done is align that entire vertical from, from kind of that day-to-day that, that -day touch of the Alumni Association, which is sending out stories and emails about events uh, all over the country tied to the ducks and, uh, and, and connecting them to other ducks throughout the, the country, uh, all the way up through our, our high-touch, high-gloss, um, you know, uh, most quality publication that we do. Um, and then we're also in the middle of that, you know, providing support for donor, uh, for donor packets and, and proposals and some of those kind of things as well, but doing it in an integrated model, and I think that's been incredibly um, powerful, and I think we've seen a lot of success with that. And that's one of the places that when I look for kind of that, um, that test or to show folks on campus a place where it's working, that's, that's one of the, the kind of the case studies I point them to. Um, so th that's been one of the really good 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 situations for us um, and and uh, yeah that, that's it's been it's, it's worked well and speaking of advancement it, it seems like for whatever reason there's a greater likelihood that advancement is structured in a more centralized fashion with unit level development officers uh, reporting centrally than than marketing is and that's that's just my informal assessment when I think of some of our peer institutions uh, across the Big Ten and I've always wondered why we don't look at marketing in more of a parallel fashion that, you know, you've got the same institution, but the development operation is more centralized than the, than the marketing operation is. I just note that, that as we, we are looking at kind of long term what the next steps are for, for integration, particularly as it relates to the academic units, we haven't made any decisions about that. There's a lot of different paths we can go down. Um, we're doing a lot of strategic communications work where we sit down with individual colleges and, and do the assessment of their audience and their business needs and then also look at, at what they're doing from a marketing perspective. Uh, communications perspective and and work with them on that. The other and with that we're building MOUs that are driving kind of our relationship with those colleges and units. Um, you know the other model we have that with an advancement here is really this kind of joint report where the director of of development for a college has a direct appointment both to the to the dean and to the VP for advancement. And that would be an easy model for us to move into from a communication standpoint at the University of Oregon because everybody gets it. We already have that model on the advancement side of the house. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things we're evaluating as we look at whether or not we're going to move forward. And that is a if um, with, with integration from a communication standpoint. And, you know, that's exactly the kind of model that I think would make sense on some levels. Um, and we're weighing that right now. Okay. And Bill, you once held the interim vice president for enrollment ma management position at Chatham at one time, so I'm sure that provided great insight into your role now and has uh, better enabled you to help break down silos across different different units. So interested to hear uh, from your standpoint the, the relationship, which you've touched on some, on the enrollment management side, but also the advancement side. Yeah, so you know, like I mentioned earlier, I, I really view my agency background, I view us as, as that agency model, and I view advancement and I view enrollment management as two of our 
biggest clients, right? Probably the bigger the be in the president's office. So when they call, that goes first. But um, you know, those are obviously very important and critical business units to the institution. And so having good working relationships with them, prioritizing their product, their projects, and working closely with them is is really important. So four months into to being hired to do marketing, our VP of enrollment management did leave. The president asked if I would step in in an interim role, and um, I took that on for about 14 months. And it was really great. It was amazing. We were able to uh, align our marketing and enrollment um, efforts more closely together. We were able to, to for me, to get a real um, bird's eye view of what they go through in the front lines of presenting our brand and 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 our our institution to to families and to interact with them. So as a marketer, it was an amazing like 14 months of of market research to be able to do. Um, and it's made me, I think, a better marketer and somebody who can really work with them and understand their needs and, and also my needs and, and have a good relationship. So the way I try to do that is, again, I, I currently do not have a marketing manager for each of those groups. So it's a role that I serve, uh, working closely with their VP and enrollment management the VP in advancement or the AVP in advancement. Um, and certain things I do, I, I meet twice a month, once with just the VP of enrollment management and once a month with her team um, so that we can um, really continue to keep a dialogue going and understanding where their priorities are, where they're going, what they need support to, to move forward with for us to be able to, to give our point of view and, and develop a, a perspective. We're currently working on a, a project around revamping the whole way we discuss messaging and affordability and value. Um, and it's very interesting to, to bring my marketing point of view about what I think consumers want to hear ver and pushing to be transparent, pushing to move uh, that conversation forward and have enrollment going, but they're scared of the price tag. And so to have a conversation where we can say, well, yeah, but, you know, this is still cheaper than the list price and it's a part of a conversation and how we move forward. So we have a really good working relationship and that comes from, I think, empathy to what they go through and setting up some clear, very good working um, benchmarks every month with them. And in advancement, it's the same thing. I meet once a month with the alumni relations team to do editorial planning for their communications that we produce and for their magazine um, that we produce. Uh, I meet uh, regularly with the VP and the AVP on the campaign. So again, it's really about dialogue at those, at those cabinet level positions so that we're all aligned um, at least on the same strategic goal, even if our point of views and executions may be slightly different. And we know that a variety of organizational structures for marketing exist across academia. And <laughs> listeners may not be able to completely overhaul their marketing structure, but what are some small steps or beginning questions that, that you would recommend to colleagues at other institutions as they think about some of these things? And yeah. Bill, let's, let's continue with you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think Kyle mentioned earlier the audit that, that he did when he came in. I think that's a tool that's in, in, incredibly important to any marketer to understand what's being done in their shop and around the institution. That's something that I also did. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect that, that I think a lot of institutions are struggling with today is trying to figure out digital, and I think that should be absolutely the number one priority. Even in centralized models, I know I see a lot, does the web report to, to marketing? Is it a shared report to IT? Um, how does that work? And for an institution like us, um, you know, it's just continuing to grow in importance. It's the number one thing we need to do with limited um, advertising dollars. SEO is such a critical part of our strategy. But if that's not part of either a good shared working relationship model or a direct model, it's Im impossible as a marketer these days to, to compete in that space. And so, you know, my, my advice is focus lots and lots of energy there. Um, and third is, is uh, the model of using freelancers or outsourced and tracking that to understand what you're spending, the project requests that you're getting in order to build your business case each year to say, we've spent X on this and we can do that cheaper in-house. I will say though for us here at Chatham, there are certain things where it makes sense to bring some things in, social media, video, those things that have an immediate or event-based need, but certain things, um, I'm also taking a very hard look. It may be a little cheaper for us to do it in-house now, but over time, maybe that might be the case. And so to continue to look at freelance models. So media relations and pitching is an area where I look at, at outsourcing some of that when it's not a critical from a crisis communication standpoint. Because that's something that over time, we may fluctuate months with nothing doing. And then three months later, we'll be busy. So I also try to look at the cyclical nature of my projects to see if it's sustainable over a year for employees in our shop. Great. And then, Kyle, your recommendations for <laughs> colleagues at other colleges and universities and, and the things that they should be thinking about. 
Yeah, I, w I would just want to echo a little bit of what Bill said first on, on the digital side. Um, you know, I talked about the video position. Um, digital is everything right now. Social media is everything right now. Oregon, our social media platforms are top 20 in the country among higher education. And we are using those, and, and Bill referenced kind of uh, public relations and, and media pitching. We haven't done a press release since I arrived at the university because we're using our own social channels to drive all this out and to push it out on our own digital platform. Um, you know, which is more powerful um, than, than a lot of the traditional media that is in the region or even the state that uh, we have here. Um, and, and I think that transitions well into the conversations that you can have with uh, units across campus as you look to improve coordination and collaboration. And that's one of the conversations that I've had where I say, look, um, you know, there, there are tremendous resources in that when we work together, we're significantly stronger um, than if you're going to go off and do this on your own. Um, and to be able to come to those organizations and say, look, here are some of the things that we can bring in to support you, and then let's create either an MOU or a service level agreement that's based on your needs and it's an assessment of what your strategy is and use those, those agreements and strategic um, kind of... Uh, 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 templates and formats to drive the work that we're going to do together. Um, and, and you don't have to move through integration to do that. You don't have to have a, look, we're all, you know, change reporting lines or change budget lines in order to create um, strong frameworks for partnership. Um, you can do that now within a good size organization um, and, and you can really sell the benefits uh, of working together if you've, if you've got kind of the right mindset for it. And as you get buy into the strategic role of marketing and, and branding across the university with internal colleagues, how do you talk about marketing's role and, and what marketing is ultimately trying to affect, especially given that there's probably some misinterpretation regarding the business decision that you alluded to earlier around the, the branding agency contract and, and how do you talk to others about marketing and again what you're ultimately trying to affect with your efforts? Absolutely. I mean, we kind of have a mission statement that, that university communications is about positioning and telling the stories of the university or telling the stories of the university that position it to succeed and thrive. Um, and, and that's really the top line priority. And then for us as our unit, uh, athletics is not part of our marketing uh, arm. We work very closely with them on a lot of things. But for our unit, um, our chief mantra and our chief goal is about growing the academic and research reputation of the University of Oregon. And so when we go down and sit with deans, you know, my line with them and is that um, this isn't about whether central communications uh, is good. It's about how can central communications support you in telling your story. Um, the deans and the colleges, that is where the rubber meets the road from a higher ed perspective. They're the ones attracting students. That's where the research is happening. That's where the innovation is happening. And if I don't have good pipelines in those, um, those units, then I'm not going to be successful in positioning the university well. And so really the way I try to position it is how can we work together um, so that I can use the things that are happening within your unit to tell the broader university story, to position it to succeed and grow, um, to position it to thrive, and, and how can I put you as the star in that? Because it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be through a central message, right? It's, it's using the places that, where the brand is actually executed um, as, as, the, as the pieces that illustrate um, why your university has impact and its importance. And Bill, earlier you talked about having to answer the questions around where you're spending the marketing dollars, how those marketing dollars are being invested, why, and, and what are the results of them, and how are you answering questions about the results and impact that you're having? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I answer them as best as I can and always I can, when I can with data, and so that's a big important part of me. And, and, and the good news is, is uh, even though we're centralized and I'm not in enrollment or I'm not in you know, another group, I'm at the cabinet. I know the results. I have access to the same data points they do. Um, you know, so I have access to enrollment reports. I've built my own marketing dashboards that layer on top of that. Um, in addition to create centralized data points, um, I, 
I look at things a little differently from some of the other groups, but between collectively, we all look at it at a really um, good uh, measurement standpoint. So again, you know, for an institution like us and where I am with marketing, again, we are trying to build um, one tangible, we want to build a, a much more sophisticated and creative brand, and we want to look at that brand being expressed in the marketplace that way, and centralization and coming through our shop allows us to do that. Um, but from there, we really are focused on the results of us. We want to build awareness and what are the metrics to help us show that we're doing that. Um, we want to drive enrollment and drive revenue. Um, and then we want to look at where we are in terms of our fundraising goals. So my approach for marketing and my metrics are very much driven um, on some of those bottom line revenue goals in the sense of being able to say we spent X but our results earned Y in revenue for the institution. And I think in higher ed, um, you'll often hear it's, 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 there's a mixed bag of emotions in terms of talking about revenue or, or products and different things like that, but I think as a marketer it's important for us to have those conversations um, because more revenue to an institution, uh, a nonprofit private institution like Chatham, means more revenue back into the institution into program development, into faculty development, and I think those are important because if an institution like us can't change in this disruptive higher ed market and find a way to, to be successful, um, then you know, we won't have an institution. And I think that's very important for higher ed as a whole right now with, as we kind of come to terms with some of the disruption that's occurring and the things that people are starting to say about the value of a, of a college degree. Mm -hmm. I just jumped in there on, on Bill's last point. That <laughs> He's absolutely right. The key piece when you think of the image, it has to be driven, you know, by that uh, those bottom line numbers of students, dollars, and we throw in votes because we're a public institution, um, and that, you know, part of the while well, you can look at, you know, you can do the market surveys and look at top of mind awareness and willingness to recommend and do all of that kind of stuff, which we all look at. You can watch your, you know, you can watch your Google Analytics on your web page, and you can watch all the the data that's coming in off your social channels. Uh, th those top line or bottom line numbers are the ones that matter most and are really the indicators of whether or not your marketing campaign and the, the, the strategies that you're putting into the marketplace are working. Well, as we close up here, I'll ask for any final thoughts or recommendations, closing thoughts that you may have, but also as you look ahead and within your teams, you both talked about digital, we know that Kyle needs uh, not just one videographer, but many, many people doing video. But what are some of those talents or, or core competencies that, that would complement what you have now or as you look ahead, whether that's from a trend standpoint or, or anticipating needs or whether that's uh, fulfilling goals that are part of your institutional strategic plan, what are some of those talents that you're trying to, to bring to your team or could really add value to, to your operation? I think from my perspective, you know, obviously the, the video, social media, create, creative, creative, creative designers and writers, those are all very important and critical parts to all of our operations. Um, as a marketer, uh, being a, a data-driven and analytic and strategic marketer, one of my focuses is really on data. And I, when, I, when I left the agency and came into higher ed, I was, I was intrigued by the idea of, of marketing and industries and disruption. And that's really what brought me here, and that's been great. What I didn't realize is how much data higher ed as a whole generates, which as a marketer is amazing. I mean, it, it, is, it is amazing with the, the information that goes into iPads, the information that is out there, it, but it's really about how we use that data. And so I have tried to foster a strong relationship with institutional research in our, in our, in our um, institution, but that idea of data, um, data analytics, data, data reporting, um, understanding data is a critical part of my shop and that's an area where over the next five years I could really see um, a, a specific need in terms of institutional research aligning more closely with marketing um, which I think would be I don't know of many institutional research departments reporting to marketing right now but I think as we see this data um, integration continue that those are going to be the opportunities that exist for us so as you add CRM as you add marketing automation and as you know, and with all the other data that we produce in terms of retention, graduation rates, that's really going to be a goldmine of of information for marketers to make st smart, strategic marketing decisions. So that's an area that I I really would would look for over the next couple of years. Excellent. And Kyle, anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, you know, I would say that that right now, higher institutions of higher education are at one of the sweetest points of of mark of the market that we'll ever be at. 
um, with the changes that we're seeing um, in the fracture, kind of the fracturing of traditional media right now, um, we have a lock on um, on what I call virtuous content, um, and you know we're not. Well, well, there is a side of things where we are selling things and we want additional students and we want more donors. You know, when when one of our researchers has a discovery, it's a it's a legitimate, interesting news story because of the discovery, the impact that it has on the nation or the world. Um, and and you know what we have at a big research university is just a content generation factory um, with some of the best and most amazing stories that you're ever going to hear. Um, and they happen every day across this campus. And the thing that is so exciting to me about higher education communication right now is our ability to kind of fill this void between traditional public relations and marketing and kind of um, the, the fractured void that's left with the, with the, the changes we're seeing in traditional media. Um, we have the ability because of uh, the, the, the work that we do, the respect that our, our academic and research functions have to really fill that void in a, in a, in a truly um, groundbreaking way. And for me, what's so exciting about higher education in the coming years is building the infrastructure to do that. And Bill's absolutely right. Uh, data analytics, we have to be smart about the, the, the way that we're interacting with our audience. Um, and it's really having and building the tools and the infrastructure to push that information out in a way that, that our audience will interact with. Um, and, and social and digital is really the place where, um, you know, as I'm looking at where we're going to grow, uh, that, that's our top priority. Opportunities abound, no question about it. And I appreciate the thoughtful discussion today and the experiences and insights that you have both shared. So Kyle and Bill, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Rob. You bet, Rob. It was a pleasure. And yeah, we know our target audiences couldn't care less how we're organized, but internally among colleagues, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> yep. uh, so again, I appreciate it very much. Thanks also to M. Stoner for making Marketing Live possible. Be sure to get reminders about this and other episodes by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. You can browse the archives at higheredlive.com or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. I'm Rob Zinkin. Thanks again for tuning in to Marketing Live on the Higher Ed Live Network.